All right, great singing. Let's have the children dismissed for our children's church. And uh, the rest of us can take out our Bibles and turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. And we'll be looking at the last two verses of the chapter. Ephesians, chapter 4, verses uh, 31. Or is it 30 and 31? No, 31, 32. Today, the, the emphasis is going to be on learning how to forgive one another. Last week, we were looking at uh, how to replace uh, angry, corrupt speech uh, with words that build up and edify. And you know what? That's easier said than done, um, especially if you have uh, patterns of speech and patterns of responses that are habitual, and all of us do. Um, and I'm sure all of us are on varying, varying paths of maturity in the way that we speak. We all have those moments where if you push the buttons just right, uh, we can respond in some rather negative ways that can unnecessarily um, basically pull down the other person. Well, today we're going to look at what I believe is really, truly the literal heart of the matter. It's one thing to want to stop that embarrassing speech. I, I think any one of us can think of things that we've said that have hurt others, that grieve us, and even embarrass us. Um, it can be very embarrassing when you blurt out the wrong thing and in anger, and then later you think, why did I say that? I hurt my testimony. I embarrassed myself as well. I hurt the other person. But you know what? Really, that is kind of a, a, can be a superficial way of looking at things if we say, you know what, I just want to stop saying those, those bad things. Um, in order to change your speech, you have to change your heart. So today we're going to look at how we can change our speech, our wrong responses, by beginning with the heart. This is just a two-point message. We'll go ahead and read verses 31 and 32, and I hope that this is going to be a help to you. Verse 31 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. So the first point that is made in verse 31 is this aspect of bitterness. Put away bitterness. The way I've put it here this morning is put away bitterness that, le that leads to abusive language. Do you see the progression here? He says, let all bitterness, wrath, which has the idea of just a rage, anger, Clamor, which has the idea of screaming, yelling. Um, evil speaking. So now you are abusing someone with, with your speech. He says, let all these things be put away with all malice, this malicious speaking. Put it away. So if we find ourselves, if we catch ourselves yelling at someone and losing our cool and using language that is actually abusing the other one, it's actually been designed. The whole intent is to harm the other individual. If we find ourselves using speech that way, chances are it comes back to a bitter heart, a bitter spirit. So really, this is where we have to start. So the Apostle Paul, remember, he's, he's teaching us, he's told us how to put off and put on. He says, put off the old man, be renewed in your mind, and then put on the new. Well, now he's showing us exactly how to do that and applying it to these critical areas. Since we are left behind by our Savior to do his work primarily as his witnesses, meaning that the, the whole purpose we are here is to speak truth to one another and to the lost, the way we speak is of a critical, critical uh, matter. 
to not only our own health, but the health of our body and to the health and success of our mission. So if we want to speak words of truth, we have to start, first start with that heart. So he begins with this word bitterness. Bitterness is derived from the description of something that had a bitter taste. Have you ever tasted something that just seemed like it turned your mouth inside out? I'm kind of cruel, but one thing I love to do, I know it's terrible, but with my little ones, I love to introduce them to lemons at an early age. <laughs> I'm terrible. But uh, just when they've just begun to cut those teeth, and I'll take that lemon and they bite into that, and at first it's like, oh, nice and cool, because it just came from the refrigerator, and their face just, they'll literally shudder sometimes. I shouldn't do it, but I do. Well, <clears throat> uh, this word bitter, is, is, it's not just something that's sour, but it, it's, it comes from the idea of something that literally causes your, your, your taste buds just to react violently. It's just bitter. It's awful. You want to get it out of your mouth. Remember the uh, in Exodus, when Moses had brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, and they were desperate for water, and they come upon a body of water, they uh, begin to drink it, and immediately they have to spit it out because it was so bitter they could not stand it, which is really saying something. When you're parched and you're famished and, and you feel like you are um, dying of thirst... It was so bitter, they still could not stomach it. And so the Lord had them, remember, uh, uh, purify that water really through a miraculous act. Well, imagine bitterness that's in our heart. A bitter heart is actually much more difficult to detect than a bitter, bitter drink or something in your mouth. A bitter heart is, is, is like a rottenness deep in your innermost being that sometimes we can ignore. A bitter heart is one that bears deep resentment about the past. I heard one preacher put it this way, um, it's anger with a history. Oftentimes with bitterness, what we end up doing is we nurse it. When someone has hurt us, we feel like the way to get back at them is to just kind of think evil thoughts toward them. And there's something that actually seems to pacify our flesh. Something about it seems to, in the moment, feel good. As you can nurse a hurt. But what we don't realize is that we do so to the rottenness of our own heart. We are actually embittering ourselves and setting ourselves up to very likely behave the very way that caused the hurt to us in the first place. Because a bitter spirit eventually gives way to abusive language as well. It does not lead to a controlled spirit and a controlled wrath. Instead, it leads to uncontrol, lack of control. Bitterness is a root that ultimately leads to abusive language. We find this also in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 to 16. I've got it for you there in your notes. Here the command is this, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Well, that's difficult. We live in a world that's torn apart. We desperately need peace. It's tough to achieve. And so he's going to tell us how to do it. Looking diligently, in the next verse he says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Esau became a bitter man. He became a profane man. That household was very dysfunctional in, in, in that uh, both uh, parents chose a favorite child. That sets the children up against one another. Scripture is using Esau as this pattern. 
Esau became a bitter person. Fortunately, there in the end, Jacob and Esau reconciled as they were adult men. But early on, they hated one another and were certainly bitter one toward the other. And it would seem uh, from, from this passage of Scripture that Esau was especially so. Jacob was certainly himself was not perfect. He was a rascal. But what's difficult about this, what's, what's scary about this, is the Lord gives us an opportunity with um, every trial that comes, the Lord gives us the grace to overcome. And there becomes a choice. When we're sinned against, we can either access the grace of God or fail the grace of God by looking to our own resources. By choosing first to become bitter. We fail of the grace of God. We let this root of bitterness take root. And it very rapidly springs up. It's amazing how quickly bitterness can mature into a full-blown, evil, wicked fruit. And bitterness does not just defile us. It defiles many because we begin to spew that bitterness out of our mouths. And then, tragically, if we, if we do not um, deal with it, many times we end up pacifying ourselves through even more gross sin. In this case, uh, fornication is mentioned. It's a very, very dangerous thing to give into and to nurse bitterness. It can lead to all kinds of destruction. The difficult thing is, though, we have a very hard time being honest with ourselves when we're bitter. Have you ever been approached, maybe by a loving spouse or a loving friend, who says, you know what, I, I think you're having a hard time with this. I, it seems to me like I think you're getting bitter. We're like, no, I'm not. I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter. We don't want to acknowledge it. And if we refuse to acknowledge it, folks, uh, we set ourselves up on a path of destruction. We have to sometimes say, um, we have to come to the Lord and say, Lord, am I harboring bitterness towards someone? And it's going to take some, some very frank honesty before the Lord. And we're going to have to say, Lord, search me, try me, because my heart is so deceitful. And I, I'm so easily self-deceived. I need you to teach me and show me. And I'm going to help you here and the Lord helps us here if you're not sure if you're bitter let's look at some of the fruits of bitterness and work backwards all right I think this could help us the fruits are a lot easier to find than the root so he says bitterness then goes to this wrath and anger these two words are very, very similar. They're almost indistinguishable as far as their meaning. Wrath does have the idea of rage. We find previously in this passage that it's possible to be angry and yet not lose control. Because the Lord says, be angry and sin not. So the Lord's saying that some kinds of controlled anger are legitimate for the Christian, but we have, what we have to be careful of is this uncontrolled rage. That's why a believer is to allow their anger to motivate a biblical and holy reaction in, in, in dealing with uh, a matter swiftly like the Lord does. So we don't run from conflict. We move to conflict. We address it always with the control of the Lord. We speak the truth in love. We don't run from conflict, right? And anger can sometimes help us to say, you know what, this needs to be taken care of. But we don't just allow our anger just to, to uh, soak us up Take, just consume us, and then we are literally riding on the rage of emotions. That is very destructive. Even when we're trying to do the right thing, because the book of James tells us that the wrath of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. So this form of anger is uncontrolled. I tell you, have you ever seen someone in a rage where literally the face is red? The, uh, the arteries here in the neck are literally as full of blood and, and literally the face is red. It's terrifying. 
Anger can take us and transform us into a monster in a moment. Or literally, if a little child is watching it, you, you, they, 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 anger can transform any one of us into a beast in a moment. Proverbs 16.32 says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. It is difficult to control our anger. If it was easy, the Lord wouldn't have to command this. This is very, very difficult. But controlling your anger is a mark of maturity, which God has called us to be, to be Christ-like. So there, there is hope for us. God would not command it if it was not possible. Proverbs 27, 4 says, Wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous. Proverbs 29, 8 says, Scornful men bring a city into a snare, but wise men turn away truth. You know what? When you lose your anger, things could be going well. And have, you, have you ever had a day like this where things seem to be going well and all of a sudden something happens and sometimes it might not even be a major thing. It might be somewhat minor, but you just completely lose your cool and you lose your anger. And you think, where did that come from? Folks, in every case, if I let that be a sign to show me a root of bitterness that cropped up in that moment, Folks, I can get to the heart of the issue. If I will take the time to say, Lord, why did I just get so angry? Why did that set me off in that way? The Lord has a greater lesson to teach you. We can't just be saying, Lord, forgive me for that wrath, but we must be saying, Lord, teach me and show me why I lost it over something that did not merit that kind of response. Your wrath, can be, God can use it to be a teacher. Clamor. This is uh, a word that could literally be translated yelling or screaming. You know, it's very difficult to um, <laughs> sometimes to have, when, when, when you're having an argument, you never see people whispering their argument, typically. Typically what they are doing is they are raising the voice and they are trying to get that point across and it usually leads to a shouting match. The volume begins to escalate. In fact, if you want to de-escalate a problem, a situation, you use that soft answer, right? Soft answer turns away wrath, Proverbs 15.1. But when we are being overtaken by bitterness, it's leading to this uncontrolled rage, we begin to yell at one another. We raise that voice, we begin to scream, to yell, to shout. This word is also used throughout the scriptures, also translated um, with the type of shout you would use when you are going to war. <laughs> but isn't that what quarreling often is? We are warring against the other person. So next time you find yourself in a quarrel, in a quarrel with someone, and you are speaking very loudly, excessively, is there a place for raising your voice on occasion, especially when you've got children and literally have to raise your voice to be heard? Yes, there's a place for that. We have to be careful, though, because our body follows um, our actions. So the more you raise that voice, especially for the men in the room, you're, you will go into war mode. Your heart rate will become elevated. In fact, uh, when we did this study on love and respect, which I'll be saying much more about when we get into chapter 5, um, women can sometimes raise the voice while keeping the heart rate um, lower, while men have a much harder time doing that. And so <clears throat> one of the things that we learned in marriage, ladies, be careful the way that you re react to the husband, because if you come in... At a, at a high pitch, your heart may be at rest, but you're coming in with a, quite a loud volume. If he comes to meet that, he's now coming in with much, much more energy than you brought to it. He's coming in at a whole different level if he has to meet you at the same volume level. 
Um, so uh, we have to be so careful because in raising that voice, the heart kicks in, the adrenaline gets going, and now you have to be incredibly careful with what's going on in your body and in your spirit. So if you find yourself losing it, and you find yourself actually using wrath and anger to manipulate those around you, I'd say for, for, for most believers that's not the case, but sometimes we can do that. We may not do that outside the home, but sometimes we do that in the home. When we use just our sheer volume or sheer presence to intimidate, that's a problem. And that's also coming back to your security is in the wrong place, it's not in God. And you're having to become almost like um, many different kinds of animals have ways of making themselves look larger to intimidate. And we as Christians don't have to get our, um, sh we should not have to rely upon a physical manifestation to intimidate the other person. When we do so, it's showing we're on the wrong foundation. We're on a selfish, self-centered foundation, and the chances are we may have a bitter heart. Chances are there are, are things that we've not dealt with because, and that's why we're not on the right foundation. So you find yourself screaming or so easily able, uh, uh, able to be provoked it could very likely come back to a matter of bitterness, something that needs to be dealt with, something in the past that still has not been addressed, or at least not addressed sufficiently. Evil speaking. This word comes from the Greek word that means any kind of speech that's defamatory or abusive. So abusive speech is really a heart issue. It's one thing to speak the truth, and the, spe the truth is not comfortable, and at times the truth can sting and can hurt like nothing else. Truth hurts, especially when you're on the wrong side of it. But truth in love, even though it hurts, it also gives life. And so you realize, wow, I did not want to hear that, but wow, do I need that. It hurts for momentarily, and then you're able to grow. Abusive speech is not like that. The pain is not short-lived. In fact, it can last a lifetime if you do not learn how to bring it to the Lord. In fact, that's often what sets us on this road. The scripture says hurting people hurt people. And chances are someone hurt you. Every last one of us have people in our lives and situations that hurt us. Hurting people have hurt us. And if we do not learn how to take that hurt to the Lord, if we say, if we just try to just not address it, oh, I'm just going to brush it off, I'm bigger than this, and we just try to move on without applying the grace of God to it, it's going to fester. And chances are it's going to grow and, and transform us to be like the people that hurt us which is not what we want. When we find a root of bitterness, we have to address it. We have to pull it. We have to apply the grace of God to it, or it is going to grow all by itself in, the, in our heart, and it's going to very negatively affect us. And we'll find ourselves using speech that was designed to destroy. It's very different than speaking the truth in love. We speak the, when, when we speak evil words, we are intending to abuse. We are intending to inflict harm. It's a tit for tat. You hurt me, so I am going to hurt you worse. You know, isn't it amazing how so oftentimes kids start a fight? And so the fight always escalates beyond what they intended. Well, I just pushed him and then he hit me. Now, but you pushed him in the first place, right? That's often the way that happens. The flesh doesn't just want to get even, really. The flesh always wants a leg up on the other guy, on the other person. So you say something mean to me, and I am going to really say something mean to you. And it just keeps going to the next level. That's human nature. 
And the scripture teaches us, Jesus taught us in Matthew 15, how, how does this happen? Jesus says, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murderers, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies, and that is the very word used for evil speaking in our passage here. Blasphemy literally means defamatory speech. That's why often we refer to blasphemy speaking of God, because when we use the Lord's name uh, and combine it with other swear words and so, such, is, is blaspheming God. It's defaming his name. But we can also blaspheme one another as we de defame one another, as we abuse one another with our speech. That is not to be the way Christians behave with one another. That might be the way the world gets even. That is not to be the way Christians address conflict. If you find, if you're the kind that always has to have the last word, you just have to. You know, you might start, you, you might start it, but I will finish it. If, if, if you find yourself being there, if you feel that your spirit can only be at peace when you've had the last word, folks, it comes back to the fact that you cannot be at peace simply standing on the word of God and who you are in Christ. You are striving to create your own identity apart from Jesus, and it's not going to work. And it's not going to bring you the peace that you're trying to achieve. So Luke chapter 6, verse 45, Jesus said it this way, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. See what the Lord is teaching us here? Our words are not the ultimate problem. And if we're just asking God for freedom from our words or freedom from our bad temper or freedom from these things that embarrass us, that's just so superficial. The Lord says there is a much deeper root that needs to be addressed and it's matters of the heart. There's typically some aspect in which you've, you've become embittered, maybe against God himself maybe against others, maybe a combination of things. Malice. This is, he says, um, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away with, uh, from you with all malice. So think of, it's kind of doubling down on this idea of defamatory speech. It's abusive. Malice has the idea um, malicious words are meant to harm they're meant to do harm. So mal malicious words are meant to tear down rather than build up. That's exactly contrary, exactly opposite to our mission, which is we find in the end of verse 16, we're to edify the body in love, to build up the body. Malicious words are meant to tear down. The power of truth is that we can actually correct a wrong with truth and build up the other person in the process. We don't have to destroy the other person to win the war. We just have to speak the truth in love. Malicious words will not accomplish that. A malicious attitude while trying to wield Bible verses in a malicious way is not going to build up either. In fact, that can do even worse damage because people can turn away not just from you but from God because you claim to be a mouthpiece for him and that's terrifying how many people have walked away from the faith because they saw more of the devil in a Christian and they saw God and yet that Christian wielded the word of God in a devilish way and turned a soul and maybe even a generation or maybe even sometimes in some cases generation upon generation away from God. Folks, our words are powerful. 
And in that sense, they have the, 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 the power of eternal life and eternal death. Not because of who we are, but because we are messengers. And if we're messengers for truth, they can, those words, folks, can bring eternal life. But if we're messengers of evil, we can literally conspire with the devil to bring eternal death. So the fruits, folks, are obvious. They may not be obvious to us in the moment. They're certainly obvious to everyone else on the receiving end or those observing. What we have to ask is say, Lord, give me an observant heart. Give me an honest heart. That When I lose my cool and I speak this way, if I just cannot seem to control arguments and they just seem to escalate out of control, I seem to have no self-control in, these, in this environment, in this place. I can't seem to, to, to control my anger. I say horrible things to, to people I love. If that's you, folks, or when you when, put it this way, when you find yourself there, because really that's all of us at some point, when you find yourself there, Ask the Lord to be your teacher. Sometimes we need to reach out to a faithful brother or sister in the Lord who's more mature. Sometimes we need to reach out to a Christian counselor to help us find the roots that needs to be dealt with, those areas in which we need to apply the grace of God. So if those are the fruits that help us to begin to look at the heart, how do we begin to change the heart? So verse 2, uh, verse 32, it says, And be ye kind, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Aren't you glad that God never asks us to do something he has not done first? He is the perfect example that we are to follow. And he's not just out there beyond us in the spiritual realm. He sent his son in flesh and blood to show us and literally be the physical expression of this spiritual truth. And now the Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit lives within us. So this is now our inheritance. This is now a possibility for you and me. Let's see how we do it. He says, be ye kind one to another. It's interesting that this word is put in that present, uh, the present tense, meaning it's ongoing. So I, uh, the, the, the point, um, point number two, is phrased this way, cultivate a tender heart that leads to forgiveness. This is not a once and done, but just like those of you who tend to garden, you have to be constantly cultivating it. Otherwise, the weeds grow up and, and take your garden, correct? You have to be constantly cultivating the soil, and so it is with your heart. So kindness is something that is cultivated. It is a process. And that should encourage us rather than discourage us. It's not a once and done. It's not a magic wand. It's a process, which means it's going to slowly over time get better. It's not going to happen in a moment. So give yourself some room there. But he says, be kind. Do this ongoing, one to another. He's going to mention this aspect of one to another. Um, he does this often throughout this passage, but I love this because it reminds us this one another and then forgiving one another. He is reminding us that, folks, God has put us in a family of believers. Our calling is to be ministering along with others, not in isolation. So really, the only way to learn kindness and to learn forgiveness is to be constantly pursuing those around us, especially believers. Some would try to avoid all of this just by becoming a hermit, and that is not what God desires. 
This is something we're to be constantly pursuing with one another. Romans chapter 2, verse 4 tells us that God's kindness is what leads us to repentance. The last phrase that's there, there in the verse says, The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. When someone realizes the wrath of God, at first that repels us. We become very afraid when we see his holiness and his, his judgment and his justice. But then when we learn the gospel that Jesus died in our place and bore upon him our sins, we realize how loving and kind God is. And it's the kindness of God that ultimately brings us to repentance. So folks, if God has forgiven us, we should be constantly striving to cultivate kindness. If God's been kind toward us, we should be constantly striving to cultivate kindness toward one another. Colossians 3, 12 and 13 puts it this way. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies. This has the idea of this tenderheartedness, kindness. Humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Folks, if kindness then is the way God is and God lives within, you may say, well, you know what? I was raised in a home in which we're just very blunt, and we, we just say things the way they are. We're not particularly kind. But that's just who we are, and that's just who I am. Folks, you are now in a new family, the family of God, that supersedes whatever earthly family that you have. And so therefore, we need to say, Lord, now my new family is my real identity. So I'm going to learn how to speak truth, and you can still be very blunt if you want to be blunt, but you need to do so lovingly and with kindness. Someone should never doubt that you love them when you're speaking the truth. Even in a quarrel, as we, as we hey, it, <clears throat> I think it is appropriate and right for your most pow passionate disagreements to be with those that you love the most because you have invested the most with them. You care the most for them. That's appropriate. But at no time as we uh, sometimes have very passionate, sometimes disagreements that we're working through. At no time should the, the, the one on the other end doubt your love for them. And since we all communicate differently, it is critical for you as a communicator to determine with that other person, how do I communicate? You'll find, you know, in parenting, I'm finding this. Every child communicates differently. And so to assure one child of your love may be more difficult than another. You have to sometimes learn how to approach the topic from different angles, right? We have to learn to do that with one another. So at no time should we, should the other person on the, on the receiving end feel that you do not love them. That kindness should be there always. That takes, that, 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 that takes a miracle, folks. That takes the working of God because that's not natural. He says, be tenderhearted. Be kind. Be tenderhearted. Kindness flows from a tender heart. The word tenderhearted literally means healthy bowels. So when the scripture calls, talks about bowels of mercy, they thought rather than speaking of the heart as we do today, say, oh, my heart is smitten for, 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 um, for, for my loved one. Um, they talked about their bowels. Oh, my bowels yearn for you. All right. They thought that the, the seat of their emotions was not the heart, but the intestines back in that day. Interesting. But very similar, we understand. I mean, what does the beating of our heart have to do with, with love, right? It's certainly more reactive, right? When you've got the emotions going, the heart can start beating when you're in the presence of, of, of your loved one, right? So it seems more natural that we think of the heart being the seat of our emotions, but we get the idea. So 
Tenderhearted is not just something we put on the face. It's something we feel. It comes from the very depths of us. It's not fake. It's real. It's transparent. It's honest. Tenderhearted. Compassionate. Empathetic. Changing the heart, again, is the key to putting off the bitterness and abuse of speech. If we're going to learn to forgive, the heart has to change. We can't just go through motions. God is tenderhearted toward us. We find in Luke chapter 1, verses 77 to 78, it says that God, he, he, uh, to, give up, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God. That's who our God is. God's tender with us. Are we tender with one another? 1 Peter 1.8 says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, and be pitiful. Be courageous. Compassion one for another. So as, as, even as we're dealing with someone that has harmed us, especially when we're talking about a brother or sister in Christ, we're trying to resolve this, there needs to be a compassion in the heart for that person that goes beyond their offense. And then lastly, be forgiving, and this is the crux of the matter. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. If you want to change that bitter, bitter heart, you have to really begin here. You can't be tender-hearted, you can't be kind if you have not first forgiven. So long before we go to address that issue with that believer, with maybe with that spouse, with that child, with that parent, with that uh, friend, long before that conversation happens, we first must settle in our own heart that we have forgiven. That is not the natural way most of us, all of us really, Go into conflict. The natural way we would, we would approach a conflict is say, okay, this is what you did against me. You need to own it, and then we can resolve. But not until you own it. And the Lord says, you first forgive. You go express. It's up to them as to whether or not they own it the way that you want them to own it. But when we think our forgiveness is contingent upon that other person, that is when we put ourselves in a cage and we hand the key to someone else who should actually, before God, does not have the responsibility to unlock that cage. Only you can. You must choose to forgive that other person. No one can do it for you. This word forgiving, once again, it is also in that present tense. Indicating that forgiveness is to be a regular practice. Remember Matthew chapter 20, uh, let's see, 18, 21, 22. In fact, turn there with me, all right? Matthew 18, 21 and 22. It says, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Peter thought he's being really generous. Seven times, Lord. <laughs> Aren't I long suffering? So he's looking to Jesus more than for an answer, he's looking for affirmation. Jesus says unto him, verse 22, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. And he just burst Peter's bubble. What? And now the Lord's speaking very symbolically. Seven is that number of completion or perfection. And he says seven times, 70 times seven. That means like never ending. What? Peter couldn't believe it. And we're going to come back to that story here in a moment. But first, before I do, I want to get across this point. Forgiveness is rarely once and done. You know, I, I told a story recently about Corey Ten Boom, who uh, had spent years in the Nazi prison camp, and she taught and preached, or not, not preached, but 
she basically gave her testimony on forgiveness and had a great ministry after the war was over and after she'd been released. She had to learn forgiveness. But at one of the speaking engagements that she was at afterwards, one of the guards from that prison came up to her. She recognized him immediately. And he says, uh, I am so thankful, Corey, that you have chosen forgiveness. Have you forgiven me or something like that? Or will you please forgive me? And she, in that moment, had to choose, am I going to forgive? And once again, all those feelings of unforgiveness came back. At first, she was just paralyzed, but she decided, no, I'm going to forgive. She reached out, grabbed his hand, and said, I forgive you. And God gave her grace to do so. I think all of us can think of, of testimonies that we've heard in which God seemed to give forgiveness all in a moment. But let me tell you, that is not what the scripture is speaking of here. Once again, this is in the present tense. It's to be ongoing. Jesus says here in Matthew, you're going to have to, not, not just to give seven times, but 70 times seven, over and over and over. Why? I believe God can sometimes grant forgiveness in a moment, especially that, that's especially true when you're never going to see that person again. I think God can give you um, the, the ability to forgive, say, maybe someone who's been abusive to you and someone you very likely should never see again. You can forgive them without any face-to-face. Face-to-face is not always necessary. I believe God can give you grace to forgive that individual. But folks, this is... Primarily, we have to learn to forgive in the context of close relationships that are ongoing. That we have covenanted together, husband and wife, and our children, and in the church. And that's where it becomes so difficult sometimes to forgive those closest to us because we have quite a history with one another. And the moment someone does it again, all the past history comes back. And we remember it all. And we have to forgive it all, all over again. And if that's you, and that is definitely me, that's all of us here, don't become discouraged and say, I can't do it. I've forgiven thousands of times, and I still struggle with this. I can't do it. Folks, realize, yes, you can. And you may be wanting something that... Um, is not within fully the, the realm of possibility. You can do it. In fact, not only can you do it, you can keep getting better at it. I think there's growth here. Maturity is possible here. You can mature in this. But folks, when we love one another and we're seeking to minister one with another, side by side, we have to recognize we are going to regularly, on occasion, hopefully, hopefully more and more occasionally, but we are going to do things that hurt one another. And that's not the end of the relationship, usually. No, it just means, usually it means we just have to apply these biblical principles, forgiven our heart first, not demand that that individual change. We can't change them. We have to say, Lord, change me through this. I'm going to address this. I'm not going to necessarily something, some, sometimes the scripture says love covers a multitude of sins. Some things are less, left better um, unaddressed. Some things just, if we're going to continue to work together, shoulder to the plow here, we have to deal with this. And so we address the matter. And usually there's the grace and the guidance by the Holy Spirit and his word to resolve that and to move us forward. Not always to the liking that each of us would like. But we can't control the other person's response. And we're not infallible by any means. But we have to continue to, to, to forgive. And you say, well, wait a minute. If you knew what is in my past and the things that have been done to me, that's one thing for you to say that. 
I could never do it. I can't do it. I've tried. I cannot do it. Folks, when you are overwhelmed with the wrong been done to you, remember this story here. Verse 24 Verse 23 says, Therefore in the kingdom of, of heaven likened, is likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him that owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and his children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. And the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, he was tender-hearted, loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, I will pay thee all. And he would not but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. And then his Lord, after that he called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye, ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Folks, some principles from this passage. If you're having a, a difficult time forgiving, first remember. Take a, a moment to say, Lord, remind me of all the wicked things that I have done. Remind me. Humble me. Remind me of how many times. Remember, folks, all sin is first against God. He has forgiven every last one. Let the Lord humble you in that moment. Remind you of all, that you, all those wicked, awful things you have done against God and against others. Remember how much you've been forgiven. And then... Thank him for that forgiveness and say, Lord, thank you for forgiving me now. In the light of that, help me now to forgive that other person. When you expect the person that you, that sinned against you to pay the debt, to make you whole, and you condition your forgiveness on that, folks, you're deceiving yourself. Because the one who stole from you cannot make you whole. Only God can. You have to look to God to do what only God can do. God is the one who forgives all. God is the one who can, get, who can make you whole. You have to look to him and then say, Lord, I'm releasing that other person. Not of responsibility, especially when um, forgiveness is not saying, okay, there's now no consequences for sin. No, sometimes, especially if criminal action has been done against us, we need to turn that over to the authorities. We don't cover sin in that way. We don't cover crimes in the body of Christ and call it forgiveness. No. But forgiveness is you saying, Lord, I am choosing in my heart to forgive that individual as you've forgiven me. And in doing so, folks, you step out of the control, out of the bondage of that person, and you step into the Lord's freedom and the Lord's light. But the Lord cannot and will not do that if you first do not humble yourself. And take a moment to remember all that you have been forgiven of. When we refuse to get forgive, ultimately it is nothing more than our pride standing in the way. This is a process. I don't think it happens in all in a moment. Depending on those things, and sometimes depending on how long we've battled, sometimes I believe you need professional counseling. Professional Christian counseling. I'm there to give as much as I can, but sometimes I have to point people on to people who know more than me because that's all they do is deal with specific areas. 
that is not a, a um, embarrassing thing to seek out a counselor. I tell you what, folks, if I had the money, I would have a counselor for every aspect of my life. Um, and I, I tell you what, I've got a wish list of, 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 I'll tell my wife all the time, different kind of counselors I want in all different aspects of my life. Most of us don't have the money for that. But folks, sometimes we need to find the money to find a Christian counselor because life is too important. And I, I know a number. So some of you may say, hey, pastor, I need some help. And I can address and help you. Sometimes it'll be beyond. I'll say, I encourage you to go meet with this counselor. Folks, and there's a beauty in that as well, because you can confide in that, in that counselor. When you come in, in, into the church, you're not wondering if I'm preaching at you or your sin, because I don't know all the gritty details the counselor does. Sometimes it can be very, very helpful overall. But folks, in, in saying, I need help, I need counsel. Folks, that's one of the most mature things that you can do. It's the fool who says, I don't need help, and he's out there drowning, and everybody knows it. But the one drowning, because, no, I'm okay out here as I drown. So, application here quickly. When you struggle with forgiveness, remember all the sins that you've committed that God has forgiven. When you refuse to forgive, you don't enjoy God's forgiveness. That's what this passage is all about. He doesn't cast us out into hellfire. But folks, when you refuse to forgive, you, you miss out on enjoying being forgiven by God. It's what 1 John is all about. You basically turn your back on fellowship with God and live as if you didn't have a relationship. And you walk in darkness. And you live in darkness. And one of the greatest tragedies is for Christians, children of the light, to live in a cave of their own making because they refuse to walk in the light. Here they've been forgiven and they refuse to enjoy his forgiveness because they refuse to forgive. The Lord says, I have already forgiven you, but I can withhold your ability to enjoy it if you don't learn to forgive. It's really what's, what's being taught here. When you f refuse to forgive, not only do you grieve the Holy Spirit and, and, and shut yourself off from intimate fellowship with him, but you, you, you give place to the devil. The devil now can begin to work and use that chisel to, to destroy you. When you refuse to forgive, you harm yourself spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Think of Saul. Folks, when you are bitter... You can have physical problems that no doctor could ever explain. And many, many people who, I'm not saying that this is true of all sick people. Certainly not. But there is a segment of people who have unexplainable ills. And part of it comes back to a, a uh, relationship issue that's destroying their health. We saw it with, with Saul and really all throughout the scriptures there's examples when you refuse to forgive, you harm those around you. We've already read the Hebrews passage. When you ref refuse to forgive, you lose the ability to control your anger and your abusive speech. But when you choose to cultivate a heart of kindness and forgiveness, you reverse the process. Isn't this glorious? When you choose to forgive, you begin to put your foot on reversing the process on that pathway. You get to enjoy God's forgiveness. You get to enjoy his love. You get to enjoy his peace. It was always there, but now you're entering into it. You get to enjoy his long suffering, his gentleness, his goodness, his meekness, his self-control. When you forgive, you find freedom from the bondage of those who have abused you. When you forgive, you break the cycle of abuse. Because if you don't learn to forgive, folks, you will abuse those closest to you. Those who spend the most time with you. When you forgive, you gain the ability to control your thoughts, your attitudes, your words, your actions. When you forgive, 
you become a testimony to God's kindness, tenderheartedness, and forgiveness. People look at you and they say, wow, how is that possible? And we get to point up and say, only through God, only through him, and point people to the Savior. So some caveats here, rarely is forgiveness a one-time event. I think we've covered that. Most often, forgiveness must be continual. We've already covered that. So in conclusion, listen to your words. Often, biting sarcasm comes from a wounded heart. Observe your words and your language patterns so they reveal a wounded, bitter heart. Observe the way you treat those closest to you. Do you treat others with kindness and compassion? Do you need to forgive? Who do you need to forgive? If you're regularly venturing your bitterness and anger on others, you probably have a root of bitterness in your heart that needs to be addressed. Then are you ready to forgive? You may know it and yet still not be ready. And folks, the Lord's ready. He's ready to forgive. He's always ready to forgive. He's always ready to give grace. But are you ready to receive it? Let's have heads bowed and eyes closed. Necessary. So thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace, for what you're going to do in our hearts this week as we meditate on these things and put them into practice. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you for your great attention this morning. Just before I let you go, um, Next week, it's not in the bulletin, but next week we will have um, uh, uh, coffee and donuts. And uh, we don't have the, it won't be the, the normal coffee with the pastor time, but we will have the coffee and donuts just as something special. So uh, plan to be with us. We'll be serving them. I think typically they're out and ready to go by 10 o'clock. So uh, hope to see you next week. Invite a friend. It's always uh, a blessing to have refreshments. Um, but uh, definitely be inviting folks, and we'd love to see you again next week. Uh, we are having the prayer meeting as usual. We've got the information there in the bulletin. So the Lord bless you, and see you again soon. Hey, Trent. Oh, yeah. Can you help me with the sound stuff again?